Priority One message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. You are listening to the Trek Ranks Podcast, a member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. This is episode 89, featuring the top five movie villains. Welcome, Star Trek fans. I am Jim Morehouse, and I am the host of the Trek Race podcast. And tonight, I am loving this topic. It's one of those simple, classic, straight-up Trek Race topics. It's a pretty finite canvas, because tonight we're doing our top five movie villains, which is pretty much quintessential Trek. When you think about Star Trek, and you think about the movies and the villains from each of those films, and even though this is a a narrow topic i think there's there's going to be a lot to cover so i'm pretty excited about it and to help us get through it we've got a returning pair of uk sector trekkies who previously joined us together for episode 64 of trek ranks when we did our ds9 underrated it's lee hutchison and carlos miranda are you guys there hey how's it going hey man so nice to be back on Good to have you back on. Of course, Lee is a movie fanatic, so this topic's perfect for him. He does uh, unbelievable film coverage for the nerd party, and his uh, and he's got his podcast, The A24 Project. We love uh, those A24 films. And Carlos, one of our most frequent guests on Trek Ranks. This is his eighth appearance, Carlos. It's number eight. I, I am honored. I look forward to it being number 47. <laughs> We are, we are closing in on 100, episode 100, so we'll have to see what we're going to do about that one. Let's get going with our check ranks recalibration. What are you recalibrating? Everything. Um, it's, it's a sweeping, uh, a recalibration of all systems. First up, as regular listeners will know by now, general order number one here at the Trek Ranks podcast that we love Trek, we love to rank Trek via some deep dive topics just to get the conversation started. And remember, it's not really about the ranks. It's just an excuse to talk about Star Trek. But what is that Vulcan motto? Um, infinite diversity. In infinite combinations. Hmm. <laughs> and what is diversity? A uh, celebration of differences. And as to poll, as Dr. Flox just said, Trek ranks is basically just a big old celebration of differences. There are no wrong answers at Trek ranks. It's not about being right or definitive in any way. It's about sharing the things we love about Trek. And we love it all from TOS to TNG, straight through to Enterprise and the Kelvin timeline, now Discovery and Short Treks and Star Trek Picard as well. It's all fair game here on the Trek Race podcast. And since this is our first ever film only topic, we don't really need a spoiler alert. So we're not going to do that. And we don't even need to remind you that episodes is a shorthand for films. Since you're probably going to be saying movies and films a lot tonight instead of episodes. So. You know, interface, net access, channel 90. You can find Trek Ranks on the net access interface links at trekranks.com. And you can contact me directly on Twitter at Trek Ranks or at Enterprise Extra. You can also call and leave us a message with your own picks at 609-512-LLAP at 609-512-5527. All right, Carlos and Lee, why don't you guys let everybody know how they can get a hold of you on the net access interface. Carlos. My handle is at Double Mac. Love to connect with other Trekkies on Twitter and, uh, you know, have a nice chat about Trek. Right. How about you, Lee? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Lee Hutchison underscore or at Star Trek VHS. Okay. Oh, yeah. Star Trek VHS. Got a big shout out on one of our recent shows with uh, with Mr. Vup, our uh, top five cliffhangers. Okay. So we don't really need a diagnostic cycle for this topic. So we're going to jump straight into our prime directive to see how everyone narrowed down their list. I do not concur with your captain's decision. She's following our prime directive. Define prime directive. Okay, so just a quick reminder that we're doing just movie villains tonight from the 13 films. That's our canvas, so pretty pretty narrow focus. And of course, but some of these films had multiple villains and some had villainous concepts. So it'll be interesting to see how everyone kind of breaks it down. There's some different ways you can look at this. So Carlos, how did you break down your list and come up with your prime directive? Like the moment you asked me to be on this podcast and the mo- you know on this particular show with this topic, I immediately like knew who I wanted, like some of the bigger ones I wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, well, I can't just be like you know all the obvious ones. So I think my my prime directive, how I really approached this was, 
it needed to be one. I wanted to keep it interesting, right? And so not just go to the obvious ones, uh, but also I really wanted to talk about villains that spoke to me personally or emotionally, either because they were conflicted characters or they were particularly compelling characters, or because you know I have a particular kind of emotional attachment to whatever film they're in. So that was kind of really as you know, the, I, I guess it's both having an emotional connection to the to the film that they appear in and making sure that I didn't just go to all the obvious ones. Yeah, this topic is tough to not just like gravitate straight toward the obvious ones. But then again, you can't not talk about some of the obvious ones. I, I have to think there'll be some duplicates at some level tonight. How about you, Lee? How did you break it down? Well, yeah, I, I kind of went a slightly opposite way. So when you kind of approached me about this topic, I got really excited because I'd recently just finished watching the movies on digital. Mm -hmm. So I, I own the, you know, the hard copies, the, the DVDs, the uh, Blu-rays. I picked them up on digital just for ease of watching them when I'm on the go or slapping on some audio commentaries while I'm kind of working away from home. So I'd recently just finished watching it and obviously still in lockdown at the moment. So I've had a lot of time to think on it and reflect on it. And I'm like, I don't want to sort of just write down my five, my secondary picks and like get that all kind of done in one evening because I don't feel like I need to rewatch these uh, movies again because they're probably the things that I've rewatched the most out of Star Trek. So I decided that I wanted to give myself like a real challenge and I wanted to exclude every main villain of every movie. So gone is your Khan, Shinzon, oh Zuafus, God. Changs, the Whalers, the Borg Queen. <laughs> I wanted to go... Those are those are gone. Those are accepted, and sort of try and dive into characters that you know through you know. I, I don't want to play my hand too much, but their behavior can cause you know disastrous consequences, death, tragedy, things that we would associate with with villains, and try and kind of shine a light on maybe some of the the overlooked kind of moments in some of the Star Trek movies, and you know really kind of push myself as a, a fan with this one because I've got to do something with my lockdown, and this is my my challenge <laughs> oh my god this is exciting that is a cool way to look at it so almost a little bit maybe a little abstract we've done a couple of abstract topics maybe you're going to have some abstract villains to talk about i i think i'm a little bit more standard i definitely did not include somebody because they were too big a name or too popular but i did try to find something in there that really kind of spoke to me about their motives and uh, what drove them to to kind of where they're at, and I and I, when I started, I didn't have any kind of trends or any thought. I just was basically going to pick the five that impacted me the most. But when I was done, I noticed two really cool trends had emerged. One which I will talk about afterwards because it's a spoiler, and one was this really interesting trend that all of the ones I picked had a very important connection to the TV series, which is my I've always I've always said I love the movies. Don't get me wrong. I always kind of put the movies last whenever I'm talking about any Star Trek series as a whole. I always think of the movies as an afterthought. I think I'm in the minority on that. Other people rate them higher, but I just like the show. I like the, the real compact stories of the show and not necessarily the big uh, scope of every movie. Yeah, it was interesting to me that that kind of happened naturally where all of them had a, had a major connection to the, to the TV series. All right, well, this, all right, this is going to be interesting to see who gets mentioned, who doesn't. There might be some big names that don't get called, but I still think some way, somehow, there's going to be more than a, more than a couple of duplicates. We will see. Okay, let's, uh, let's do it, Third Romoticlon. Introduce us to the order of things. I am a Jem'Hadar. He is a Vorta. It is the order of things. Thank you, Third Romoticlon. And as always, just a quick reminder on how we're going to go through the order of things. First, each of us will reveal our five-word summary and a hashtag to tease our pick. Then we'll name our top five movie villain and the specific reasons we're highlighting them. And at the end, we'll ask everyone for a few secondary system selections for the picks that maybe just missed our list. And as always, if we have any duplicate picks, make sure you listen for the Defiant Torpedo. Should, maybe I should do the Reliant Torpedoes. Well, we'll see. We'll <laughs> see. If I can come up with a good soundbite, maybe I'll do that. Okay, Carlos. Let's kick this off with you. What's your number five pick for a top five Trek movie villain? All right. Well, my number five pick, my five words are, congratulate you or not, Jim. Hashtag machine guns ready to go. And it is from Star Trek Six, And the villain is Fleet Admiral Cartwright. 
There we go. A Starfleet bad roll right off. A the bad bat. roll. <laughs> so, okay. So I am not necessarily like, I'm not a big fan of like the whole bad roll thing. You know, I know a lot of people are, but the reason I chose Cartwright is that I love Star Trek six, like love, love, love Star Trek six. And, and Jim, that's like the great divergence between. I, you and I know. Man, I know. Man, right. I love and, it too. I just don't. Rate it. You need to love it more than you do. (laughs) Okay, all right. (laughs) Okay. The point is, though, I love Star Trek VI. Um, I love General Chang. You know, I think there's great villains and great kind of very melodramatic villains in Star Trek VI. But the reason I I chose Cartwright is because Star Trek VI was my introduction to Star Trek. As I've said on this show and a couple of other podcasts, the first time I watched Star Trek VI, I watched it with no sound because I I watched it while I was in a drive-in. Right. And my parents were watching one movie and I had no desire watching that movie. So I watched the movie in the next screen, but I didn't hear the sound and it was Star Trek six. And I was just kind of smitten by it. Right. So it was my introduction to Star Trek. Then I went on to watch Next Generation religiously. And it actually took me a while before I revisited Undiscovered Country because it took a while for it to come out on video and I didn't get it right away. I was really into the series, into, into TNG. And, and TNG, for the most part, is such like a, it puts Starfleet up on a pedestal. And to me, Cartwright was the first time that I really realized not everything is right in paradise. And so to me, Cartwright really kind of personifies the fact that Starfleet is the military and that there are people within Starfleet that are willing to take the law into their own hands and do what they think is right, no matter whether or not it adheres to Federation principles. And so I think to me, Cartwright really represents the fact that there are villains within Starfleet, that not everyone is a Captain Picard. So you have that element to it. The other thing I love about Cartwright is that the fact that he was introduced in Star Trek IV, and in Star Trek IV, because of the, the emergency that, that that that's in the movie and the way you yeah. see Cartwright in the movie, right? He is like a stand-up fleet admiral, right? No. He's like he's like he's in there in the control room with the president and Sarek and trying to make sense of the whole thing and really take charge. So actually, unlike the other villains, in, you know, whether it's Valeris or the other kind of um, you know Colonel West, the other the other kind of uh, Starfleet characters in Star Trek Six. There was a little bit of an arc. You already kind of knew Cartwright. He was recognizable. He wasn't the new leg. Like, he wasn't the bad role of the week. So I think to me, Cartwright really is is a super interesting character. The fact that he was played by Brock Peters and he comes back later on as Captain Cisco's father. It's just like an added bonus as well because you just you connect with him and you know. And obviously he he had such a kind of long and distinguished career as well. So to me. Cartwright is an amazing villain, like all good villains. They don't think they're villains, right? And in the time that he's that he participates, obviously, in, in the conspiracy at the Kittimer massacre, he wants to hold on to a part of life. He want, he doesn't want life to change. He doesn't want to be friends and, and, and make peace with people that he's been fighting this whole life. And there's a lot of people like that in the real world. So to me, Cartwright is a very believable Star Trek villain, one with a little bit of an arc, and one that I just kind of that was very surprised that it kind of shattered that image of what Starfleet and the Federation is. Well, my my favorite thing about Admiral Cartwright, well, beyond Brock Peters, of course, being awesome, awesome is the continuity from Star Trek Four. I was I'm glad you mentioned that because I love that that connection shows uh, there's a little bit of a thread through the movies. Uh, Lee, what is your take on Admiral Cartwright? Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent choice as well. And one thing I would echo is that those early scenes where you see them around the the table, and you know he's just kind of giving out this absolute disdain, quite bigoted or racist comments about the Klingons. And what I find interesting is, especially with someone like sort of Nicholas Meyer, kind of as the writer director of this film is, and I refuse to believe it's not intentional, is when we think of Brock Peters as Star Trek fans, we naturally gravitate towards his roles in Trek and, and Deep Space Nine, is also kind of what you think of like To Kill a Mockingbird, where this iconic film, he's a black man that is accused, you know, falsely of, of raping a white girl. You know, he, he's got such a kind of, you know, association with that kind of role. And, and to see someone that we associate with that kind of role and character decades later, he's kind of the table's turn. We see his sort of racist side as a character. I found that a really kind of interesting idea and sort of it challenges the the audiences that might be coming into this, that might be, you know, people that as young kids saw that movie and thought, oh, that's guy from that uh, you can't expect him to be the the bad guy or kind of fault here so i think it plays really well with kind of audience expectations not just sort of cartwright but who's the man behind it 
Nicholas Meyer is such a, a fan of cinema, right, and of literature. And he knew, you know, he, 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 he contributed significantly to that script, obviously, right, and to that story. He wasn't just a director. He chose to have Edward Cartwright, who was played by Brock Peters, because, you know, he chose to have Brock Peters kind of deliver that speech at Starfleet headquarters. And none, none of that is by accident, right? All of that was intentional. And it just adds to, like, the gravitas, I think, of the character, because he's portrayed by this a wonderful, amazing actor who's known for these other roles, but also through the, you know, who has some continuity, continuity within Star Trek. Brock Peters, a uh, legend to say the least, and awesome deep cut pick to get us started. Carlos, all right, Lee, how about you? What's your, uh, what's your number five pick? Yeah, so my five words summary in a hashtag is should have listened to Cheers Rebecca, hashtag one big happy fleet, and that my choice is Admiral James T. Kirk in Star Trek II The Rap. Oh and my so with God. my <laughs> <laughs> Oh Lee. Wait, so this is wait, so this is Kirk in Wrath of Khan, not yeah. Not undiscovered country okay nope, i cannot nope. wait to hear this so what i'm going to do with mine is i should have put this in my prime directive is that i'm going to go through mine in sort of chronological order okay, so yep. we'll go from motion picture through to star trek beyond so i've kind of chosen um admiral kirk here because ultimately his complicity has kind of you know he's a complacent captain in this film you know he's someone that has you know you think of this original series kind of captain kirk always ready for adventures, phasers on goal, shields up, diving into action. You know, this is a captain that became an admiral, got bored behind a desk, went back out into space. And, you know, we've sort of seen him become then a teacher. And I think his senses have become a bit dulled. And I think Starfleet, I, I was kind of reminded of um, Kral and Star Trek Beyond that peace has made the Federation, Captain Kirk, very soft, that you have this ship coming in, red flags all over the place. You know, you have this junior officer basically piping up saying, we need to put the shields up. You know, there's problems going on here. Spock, yeah, it's fine. We've got to listen to the captain. Kirk's just stroking his chin. Hmm, wonder what's kind of going on here. And by the time it even commits to a simple yellow alert, you know, shots are fired. You have crew members burned, radiation exposure. You have Scotty's nephew killed. Captain Kirk has made such a catastrophic kind of decision here, essentially kind of snowballs into the rest of the movie that the Enterprise is, continues to become crippled. Yes, he does have his successes within the movie, but ultimately the damage is done in that kind of first strike and that we see it that will ultimately kind of end in, in Spock's death as sort of he allows Khan to get the better of him and, and sort of start them down this road to kind of disaster. Okay, so I will fully admit I did consider Kirk in the motion picture for for being such a villain to to Will Decker in terms of coming in and taking over the ship and then just and blaming him for everything and the guy's just like trying to just help and do his job. I did not consider him for the wrath of God. I uh, amazing deep cut pick, but I his complacency is not even. I mean that's part of the movie. That's a big part of the movie early on uh, getting back into the captain's chair. So Carlos, what's your take on Kirk in uh, the wrath of God? You know, I buy Jim's argument. I mean, I think Jim, uh, I think I think Kirk is a real ass in the motion picture, right? And he's just, you know, he throws his weight around, and he's not yeah. particularly likable, especially at the beginning of the right. motion picture. You really feel for Decker. You're like Jesus. But you know, I I, I love Lee throwing you know a grenade into yeah. into our discussion <laughs> because I think that's awesome, and this is why I love this stuff, right? I don't necessarily agree with you, Lee. Yeah. I don't think that Kirk is the villain in any way, shape, or form. I mean, from Khan's perspective, one hundred percent, right? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, I think from my from, from where I'm sitting, I think Kirk is just almost negligent and slightly incompetent, <laughs> which is an odd thing to say because in Star Trek Three faces his villains, right? And kind of comes to terms with it. And his whole gung-ho, we must steal the Enterprise, we must rescue Spock, is him trying to make amends for the wrongs and his inaction in, in Wrath of Khan. So I see what you're saying. I don't disagree with the fact that his inaction caused all of those things, but I don't necessarily think that you can see him as a villain there, but I love the fact that you brought it up. I mean, this is a great, it's a great conversation point. That's what Trek Ranks is all about. Who cares about the ranks or the pigs? <laughs> this is a great 
a great way to uh, look at it. Different. The thing I the thing I love about that scene is that he immediately says, "You go at, you go right on ahead. Keep quoting regulations at me, knowing the error of his ways." Okay, awesome, awesome start from Carlos and Lee. All right, my number five pick. My so my first pick's a little bit outside the box. Not that your guys is. So I guess to match well, what you guys have done, I don't expect to see this person on anyone else's list, but I guess you never know at this point. But I, one of my favorite things about Trek is the mythology of 778 episodes and how things can change when you alter perspectives, even, you know, five, 10, 25 years after a certain event. And we're seeing that a lot now with Spock and Discovery. And we saw it in a place that I never expected in Star Trek Picard. So my number five pick, five words and a hashtag. I watched it happen. Hashtag. Don't tell me it didn't happen. And it is Nero from Star Trek 2009. And the reason I picked Nero, I would be the first to say that from the 2009 film, he's maybe a little bit of a, uh, a rote villain in terms of some of his motivations and they're a little bit thin, but I loved in Star Trek Picard after the episode of remembrance, when we learn that what has actually happened here with Nero and there's his reasons for hating earth and Vulcan so much are based on the fact that Starfleet had a plan. They were going to help Romulus. They were going to help, uh, the Romulans relocate, and then as soon as something went south, they, they pulled out, they backed out, basically left them on their own. And that is how Nero views the Federation. It's how he views Spock. And it makes way more sense now that Spock's was kind of, in the movie, when you're thinking Spock's kind of on a one-man mission to save Romulus, you're thinking, why, why would he be on a one-man mission to save Romulus? But now it makes sense because everyone else has pulled out and he's put his resources to the one thing he can try to do. With the red matter, he fails. Nero just sees blood in terms of the Federation uh, letting uh, Romulus be destroyed and not save uh, as many Romulans as possible. And I love that. And plus, it, Eric Bana in this role is awesome. He's chewing scenes. I love the way he, as a villain, goes from zero to a thousand, just like really quick, just this calm rage, where whether it's when he kills Captain Rabot or when he's screaming at, at Pike that, you know, I saw it happen. All that stuff's great. I love the Narada. I love, hello, Christopher. I'm Nero. Uh, it's all great stuff. So Nero, what's your take on that one, Carlos? Um, I, I, I love Nero. I think that you're right. A hundred percent. And I have thought that thought about that too. That mm. one of the things that I loved about Picard, uh, the series is that I also think that, you know, to your point about giving, extra backstory and kind of color and meat to the bones of Nero because he is in many respects a very kind of two-dimensional villain and I, I agree with you but, but I agree with everything that you said I think Eric Bana is great in the role I love his hello Christopher I'm Nero you know there's so many yeah. great he seems like such a kind of approachable nice guy and then on a dime he just you know takes a spear and plunges it to Captain right. Robert, you know? right like it's just wonderful um and he's a great villain but but I do love the fact that some of this later Trek has has gone and added color to some of the background. I think Picard has made Nemesis, for example, infinitely better. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I now watch Nemesis knowing with what's going to happen, and it just makes everything better. Yep. So I think Star Trek continuity in, in, in canon is very fluid in, in a way. Yep. When new Trek adds color and and complexity and backstory to old trek it's just the best agree and picard makes nero uh, star trek picard makes nero a better villain uh lee what's your take on nero yeah i would echo that as well like he, i enjoy nero in star trek 2009 that he's this charismatic kind of villain but you always felt like well you know, really, where the sort of the Federation responsible? I can sort of see right. the kind of the Romulan side. I can see why, or the Vulcan side. I can see why we want to go like trash their home. But you kind of watch something like Star Trek Two, uh, Star Trek Picard, and you get excited when you're thinking like this moment, this supernova, and this movie that came out, you know, over a decade ago. Now, people have managed to make so much from it in terms of you know Una McCormick's fantastic book Star Trek Picard, when they mentioned like, oh yeah, we are going to be really playing with this, the destruction of kind of Romulan it gets you really excited because it feels like it brings everything together in such an exciting way and you know it's easy for people to dismiss the Kelvin movies oh they're just a reboot they're nothing to do with the the other films but you think 
what kind of kickstarted those movies is playing such a huge role in the other timeline. It just just excites you as a fan and makes the movies all the more richer. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I also think that what's funny about the Kelvin movies, and I actually think it's a real. In the first movie, it works great. I think in Beyond, it works fine. Um, I think in in Into Darkness, it's it's a real like it's it's the movie's Achilles heel. But I think all you know when you think about it, all three villains in the Kelvin movies originated in the Prime timeline. Every single one of them, right? Yep. So I think it's really it, it's your point, Lee. I think it's really interesting that uh, you know that, that that even though it is this parallel universe, it is this other timeline. It's very yesterday's Enterprise type of thing. Actually, all all the villains and all of their motivations come from the prime timeline that we all live and breathe and love. I would rather suffer the death of Romulus a thousand times and accept help from you. <laughs> all right. So, okay. So let's, okay. Go, let's go to round four. Carlos, what's your number four pick? All right. My number four pick, uh, my five words are, watch where you're going, dumbass. <laughs> Hashtag, look up to the skies and see. And I'm going to go with, Humanity itself. I love it. <laughs> I just rewatched Star Trek four three times. And I say three times <laughs> because I, like Lee, have recently bought all of me. In fact, it was because of Lee's tweet about all the Star Trek original 10 Star Trek movies on sale on iTunes that I bought them all. And I realized that I had never, ever, ever listened to any of the audio commentaries. So I bought them all. It, they were like $15 on the American uh, iTunes account. I have been watching each movie and then watching and listening to all the commentaries. So I have just watched, so I watched Star Trek Four, which I hadn't seen in like two or three years for some reason, but I listened to the audio commentary with Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner. Uh, it's so funny. William Shatner adds nothing of value to that commentary, <laughs> but Nimoy is a joy. Like he's just wonderful. So I've had Star Trek Four very much front of mind. What I love about Star Trek Four is the fact that there is no villain. There is no, you know, twirling mm -hmm. mustache. There's no Krooge. There's no Borg Queen. There's, there's no Nero, right? It's just like humanity, because of incredibly selfish, incredibly short-sighted reasons, you know, we have let countless species go extinct and or been directly responsible in the, in the case of humpback whales and in the case of the movie. Um, and I just, I think that that movie plays better with age and if you look at everything that's going on right now um you know we're still just as short-sighted we still are you know just as selfish as a species as we've ever been so i really feel like that what's so brilliant about Star Trek four is that we our species are collectively the villain right because of our inaction and because of our action something terrible happens we don't think anything of it but actually you know we're so self-centered and i love that line for spock where spock basically says something along the lines of like you know why do you think that this probe is meant for humans yeah. and it's just it just kind of blows your mind and it, and it opens you know and it reminds you i think sort of core reminds you that earth wasn't made for us you know what i mean there's a lot of other species out there that don't really care about you know us being around and I just, I, and I love that part of the film. I love the fact that the film is an environmental piece. It's very, very much has a message. It very much has, has, has this wonderful unorthodox story about not having a villain at a time when really like the studios were like, what do you mean you're not going to have a villain? It's just going to be this probe. What? So I just, I love that movie so much with all of my heart. I think it's one of the best Star Trek movies. It will forever be one of the best Star Trek movies. And part of it is because it's the one that really speaks to us that we are collectively responsible for our actions and how we treat this planet. And one day it's going to bite us in the ass. Yeah. I, I like the way you say that it plays almost even better today than it, than it did 25, 30, 35 years ago now almost. Oh, come on, Bob. It's never been proven their intelligence is oh, in any way. Oh, come on, Bob. I don't know about you, but my compassion for someone is not limited to my estimate of their intelligence. So, Lee, how about you? What is your take on Star Trek Four? I, I love this pick. Yeah, it's so good as well, too, because it's one of those ones. I always think when I get a bit frustrated when people go, oh, yeah, it's the one with the whales. Like, it was so bold of them not to have a villain, and it's like... Right. You are kidding, right? Like the villain is like the humans. Like there's whalers out there. Just like if you'd swapped a whale for some alien creature or something like that. Because Star Trek tends to like 
do space aliens that look like whales, sort of in Voyager and Enterprise. So it's like, if you just imagine that was an alien, replace the whalers, mankind with some aliens with something on their forehead, you'd be like, oh, look, they're clearly the villains. But it seems to be that people maybe struggle to kind of pick out that humanity could ever be anything like that. Yep, yep. It's an awesome, awesome pick. All right, Lee, how about you, man? What's your number four pick? Yeah, so my five words um, and uh, hashtag are guess who's coming to dinner, hashtag Nicholas Myers' vision, Roddenberry's nightmare, and it is the crew of the Enterprise A. Okay. So now this I can get behind uh, from Star Trek Six, right? Yeah, so we've pretty much got a kind of crew that are essentially portrayed as the villains for most of the movie mm-hmm. that are completely racist, bigoted, make assumptions about alien human race. You know, there's so many times that they get absolutely pulled up on their, their antics. I mean, you, if you watch the kind of film from the beginning, you have the Klingons in crisis and you're watching it thinking like, well, me as a Star Trek fan, I know that the Klingons are sort of historically the the bad guys. Like they must have done something, you know, anything like that. So you kind of watch it and you think at the beginning, like, oh, should we report this kind of even? They're almost slightly dismissive of like, is this even worth kind of reporting? And then you kind of go to this conference meeting, you get people together, you have admirals kind of giving off bigoted remarks, saying that they should kind of let them die. You have your lead actor basically saying, well, I don't want to save them. And then they head off into space. Kirk's ranting that he never trusts them because they killed his son. He holds a grudge. They have dinner together. They get compared to Nazis. And the Klingons really don't give you too much, apart from sort of some, you know, odd behavior at the table, about claiming that Shakespeare's their own. You don't sort of look (laughs) at them. If you're maybe young Carlos Miranda watching this for the first time, think, God, those Klingons are pretty bad guys. And then you have Federation officers that are going onto the ship, shooting it up. And you're thinking, well, I'm still not seeing the Klingons as the bad guys here. It's Federation officers clearly at it. And as the film kind of unfolds, you have things as simple as, you know, McCoy kind of going, oh, God, I'm so glad that they're away. You know, people saying like Ahura, they smell. Chekhov, you know, someone that's from a race that's kind of you know, been thrown under the bus many a time in the sort of run-up of Star Trek series, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which has its own sort of racial connotations. Even things like, I think it's an underrated line as well, that um, human rights, the very name is racist, that these people are going around the universe going, human rights, human rights. And you can almost draw a parallel with these, you know, people that say all lives matter or, you know, and so on, that they're like, oh, you know, human rights, human rights, as they go out into the galaxy when things are a bit bigger than that. And I just love the amount of bigotry. And at the end of the movie is about someone learning to overcome their bigotry and their hatred and kind of work towards a better future. And ultimately, the only Klingon that you really see as a bad guy is Chang. You see more pretty despicable behavior from the crew that you've been with for, for 30 years in terms of how they behave how they act how they treat an alien species that are looking for help it's pretty despicable the crew of the enterprise a and as kind of jim uh, as carlos touched on earlier you know even the head honchos at starfleet okay so i agree with all that uh the one thing i'll i'll say is it didn't play like that in 91 when the movie came out because that that's the one difference i'll say i, I think it plays that way now which is one of the reasons this movie's dropped on my on my list, but it, whether you knew who the Klingons were or not, if you were watching this in 1991, the heroes were clear. And that was those, all the actions that you just described. So people weren't seeing that in any kind of different light. Hopefully that makes sense. But I think through time, people look at it now. It's like, wow, why are they, why are they being so racist? I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, Carlos, what's your take on the crew of the enterprise in star Trek six? So I don't necessarily disagree. I mean, Nicholas Meyer, in fact, even on your podcast, Lee, which, by the way, is just a little awesome. plug for Lee's kind of yeah. conversation with Nicholas Meyer. If you haven't listened to it, it is hands down the best like interview about Star Trek and his career that, that I've ever listened to. Yeah, I think so he good. does so good. But, you know, he talks about it in, in, in his Star Trek 2 commentary, which I listened to recently. You know, he sees... Starfleet very much as the Navy and not just the Navy, like the the American Navy, right? Like going around talking about American rights and like the America's views of the world that he kind of sees the Federation like that. 
And rightly or wrongly, that's very obvious to me, right? And I do think to your point, Lee, that line that she says that the very name is racist and the way she says it is the, 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 the actress delivers that line so well. I think it's right. But I think that's the beauty of the film is that you have these characters that for 25 years have been fighting these guys. All they've ever known is war with the Klingons. And I think it really humanizes the fact that these characters all have their own biases, you know, and they range from kind of microaggressions and being passive aggressive right down to being just flat out racist, like in terms of people like Bones and other and, and other characters. Um, and Spock always being the one that never quite understood the racism. But I think that's what makes the movie work is that these it's totally believable that 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 these characters, their entire lives, they know these people to be villains. They've been fighting them. They, you know, Kirk lost his son and 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 they don't like them. They hate them. But then throughout the course of the movie, they come to realize that that, that that's wrong. Right. Um, and I think that's for the very reasons why that you've highlighted. I think that's why the film works, because I do think that they realize all of this. I think that there is an arc in the film. And I think that at the end, they realize that um, no, actually, we were wrong, and Kirk says so. Yep, that's fair, and obviously, that's the that's uh, the correct take on this, and Jim. that's the culmination <laughs> of the of the film, the Star Trek Six: The Search for Boots. Okay, let's go to my number four pick. Five words and a hashtag. Misguided Trek captain seeks revenge. Hashtag a true TOS callback. This is my favorite thing about Star Trek Beyond. It is not Crawl. It's Balthazar Edison, the human captain that is revealed to be the main villain of Star Trek Beyond. I love this about this movie, and I'll freely admit that while I was watching the film, I was loving the movie and enjoying it, but I was thinking, well, there's not much here with this Crawl character in terms of his motivations. And then it just all switched on a dime when it was revealed that he was a a past Starfleet captain with all this awesome history, which won't even get into that. The way it connected to the past Trek was really cool. But the thing I love about it is that through the years of Star Trek, these uh, rogue captains who've kind of gone on, gone off the deep end is just a, it's a regular thing in TOS. You have captain Tracy from the Omega glory. You've got John Gill, who is more of a, observer but in patterns of force you've got merrick from bread and circuses you got captain ransom from voyager you've got garth of izar dr corp i mean there's so many that of this type of you know ben maxwell there's there's a ton i have listed here but i i love this reveal because it was such a great tos callback when it was revealed that uh edison had figured out kind of this this way to prolong his life and uh, control this, this colony in Star Trek Beyond. One of my favorite things about that movie, I think he's a massively underrated villain. I don't get, I think some people just don't get that side of it. And he was the captain of the Franklin. I mean, come on. The Franklin is an amazing ship. Uh, Lee, what's your take on Balthazar Edison and Beyond? Yeah, I think it almost ties into sort of Nero earlier because I think a lot of people could watch Star Trek Beyond. You know, I saw it with friends. They enjoyed it. Yeah, he's a fine enough villain. Oh, the Zindi War, whatever, that's some alien species. Whereas I think, imagine all three of us are sitting there whenever we watched it that first time, like going, oh my God, this like this ties into Enterprise. Enter- right. Enterprise has been made credible. It's tied into the canon. I think little things like that, that really excite you. And I've always been slightly frustrated with the the character because I always felt just in that few moments, I wanted to see him turn, him to look in that bit of glass and go, you know what, what have I become? And sort of reach inside to that Federation part of him. Instead, he sort of gives in and he tries to stab Kirk with the, yep. the glass. And I I'm always think of that moment, I think that the film could just be that little bit ri- richer of a villain if that turn had been made as opposed to sort of giving in to sort of the, maybe the pantomime, pantomime side of, of being a villain. So I'm torn by that because I know exactly what you're saying. And in that moment when it happened, I, I, I had the opposite thought. I had, oh, he's going to he's gonna go good and see the error of his ways, which to me would be a little bit of a cliche. And then they didn't go there. And it went, no, now I'm even more pissed and I'm going to kill you. And I, 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 I see both sides of it. I could, I could actually argue both sides of it being the better way to go. But they definitely – tricked me because at that moment i thought oh here we go it's the standard 
villain sees sees the light, but they didn't do that. So, uh, Carlos, what's your take on Balthazar Edison? So I kind of feel about Star Trek Beyond the way you, Jim, feel about Star Trek Six. Is that there's there's a couple of things I really like about Beyond. I think that Yorktown is like an amazing like sci-fi set and design for the ages. I think that the crew of it, their uniforms is my favorite like take on TOS era uniforms ever. Um, you know, I think that the actors are great, like primarily like the main cast. They feel very much lived in in those roles. I mean, Carl Urban might be more McCoy than 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 the Forrest Kelly in a weird sort of way. And so there's a lot I like about Beyond, but I, I'm not crazy about Beyond. And the main reason I'm not crazy about Beyond is because I never understood the villain at all. I am, as you know, like here we are many years later talking on a sort of podcast. I am here for like weird sci-fi twists, right? Don't get me wrong. Yep. I just, I never got it. I never understood it. Literally the first time while I was watching it, I completely agree. I think the Zindi things, the Mako thing, the, the Franklin, all of that, I think are great shout outs and they're cool. You know, it, it, it's all cool kind of tendons tying the, the, the franchise together. But I never, I le- legitimately have watched that movie several times and I still don't understand his motivations. I don't understand the whole, why did him and his entire crew get warped? I don't like into like, you know, get transformed into these aliens. I don't understand how that they, they get detransformed throughout like the story and he becomes more, more I just don't understand. None of it makes any sense to well, me. Beyond, beyond the sci-fi MacGuffin stuff of them changing and, and all that stuff, it, that's that, that we can put that aside. The motivations are similar to the undiscovered country because Starfleet, the Federation was telling them, no, you have to sit down with your enemies now. We're, you're, we're no longer at war. You're going to help us make peace with them and build relations with them. And he, and he could, not, uh, could not cope with that. I see the argument, but I genuinely think that it's so bogged down, at least in the other yeah. in the undiscovered country, there's two things. It's built on 25 years of, like, of, of, this, of this same <laughs> narrative. Right. And you see it. It's very clean. It's very it, it, it's it's what the story is about. I think that, you know, to your, to, if, if I call it the same thing that you did, the sci fi MacGuffin, I feel like he he he's a wasted actor, a wasted villain. Oh, I disagree. Disagree. Because of the weight of, of the sci fi MacGuffin. OK, I, well, we, we could debate <laughs> this. If it was another podcast, we'd debate it and we'd you know go on about. 35 minutes of the search for boots, which made no sense. <laughs> Literally makes no sense. It's it's one third of the movie. Maybe you've never heard the Russian fairy tale of Cinderella. When <laughs> times try and break down, the only next thing could go, the, there's an old Vulcan proverb, only next thing could go to China. There's a lot of things if you want to go down oh, with that film that so are funny. absolutely baffling. It's one third of the movie. Okay, we are, but we're not going to do that. because This is Trek ranks and all we talk about is the things we love about Star Trek. So we're going to go to the soup round. And now, as I'm sure that somebody out there has said, it's time to pay for the soup. And Carlos, what is your number three pick? My number three pick. uh, My five words are, time has no meaning there. And my hashtag is, who wants to live forever? And it is from Star Trek Generations, Dr. Tolian Sora. Great pick. So obviously, I chose kind of like a, a deep cut and a little bit of an abstract cut. For my soup round pick, I just wanted to go straight up mainstream villain here. <laughs> so I love Malcolm McDowell. I I love the character of Sauron. Generations was was a film to me that like like that I absolutely adore that movie. And I see the kind of everything wrong with that movie from every perspective. It's like it, it, it it's so obvious, right? But that movie to me, I just I just love it, and I love it because. It was the first movie that I, as a kid, I was like 11 or 12 when it came out. And it was the first movie that I like, I, I, I like lived the, the, the anticipation for, right? So I remember when, Jenner, you know, when, when they revealed everything from, you know, the, the new Delta Shield, like the building up. I used to watch this like coming attraction show on E! every single time I could just to be able to see the trailer because obviously when we didn't have internet. You couldn't just see the trailer whenever you wanted. Um, so like uh, Generations to me it is a movie that I love dearly. Um, and part of it is because I think the villain is just wonderful. I think Malcolm McDowell plays it in the best possible way. You know, he's just as good as an actor as Patrick Stewart. And, and the scene in 10 Forward where they're at it is just so intense and wonderful. Dr. Solid. Yes. 
Ah, yes, Captain. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I understand there's something urgent you wish to discuss with me. Yes. I must return to the observatory immediately. I must continue a critical experiment I've been running on the Amagosa star. We're still conducting our investigation into the attack. As soon, yes, as, that is, I... as soon as that is complete, then I will allow you and your colleagues to return. But until then, there's nothing I can do. Timing is very important in my experiment, sir. If it's not completed in the next 12 hours, years of research will be lost. We're doing the best we can, if you'll excuse me. They say time is the fire in which we burn. Right now, Captain, my time is running out. We leave so many things unfinished in our lives. I know you understand. See what I can do. Um, I also love the fact that, like Khan, Sauron is a man wanting to, in, from his perspective, wanting to right a great injustice that's been done to him, right? And in both cases, like Khan, it has to do with his wife, right? Obviously, Sauron has family, but it's really about his wife. And the Nexus gives him this ability um, to like be reunited with her. So I, I love complicated villains. And I love the fact that, you know, he says, you know, there was a time when I wouldn't hurt a fly. And then the board came. So it's a great villain from the point of view that it ties to this larger, like, mythology. It, you know, he, he's an Elorian, like Guinan. Um, so it kind of fleshes out the character of Guinan a lot. I think he stands up to Picard, you know, toe to toe. And he just, he just has a lot of fun. You could just tell that he was just like he was having fun. Um, so I, I think I think Sauron is uh, a villain, uh, a wonderful villain for the ages. Yeah, he's a totally underrated villain. I love, I just love that he's Elorian and yeah. that connection with with Guinan and the way that they both kind of understand the Nexus. Yeah, I love this. Malcolm McDowell's awesome in that role too, and he killed Kirk. I mean, he's a villain. I didn't even talk about that. <laughs> Lee, what's, what's your take on Sauron? Yeah, like I'm, I'm the same. I, I need to pose this question to you guys, I suppose, is like, is Soren one of the most quotable Star Trek characters ever? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like from time to time and quite a lot sort of during the past few months, I'm just sitting there going, you know, time is the fire in which we burn. <laughs> and no one ever kind of pulls me up on it or anything like that. And it's just like, it's just one of those lines that is so great to just drop into kind of conversation. Like fans will get it. Other people will look at it and go, can, you almost probably get the impression of being like um, the guy that's sitting next to Leonard Nimoy in the Simpson monorail episode. Like, can I get out a seat away from this kind of guy? Yeah. I just think he's such a quotable, quotable villain. I just would have loved a, a little bit more of him in Star Trek Generations. He's he's a fantastic actor, and you know, I, I, if there was one man to kill Kirk, it's Malcolm McDowell. Fun thing I, I learned on, on Memory Alpha that's actually that wasn't cre- uh, that that line is from a poem not even that wasn't written for him it's from a poem and that they got it in a book of poetry like in a, in a oh, book. i don't think i knew that I, I didn't know that i always think of time as a as a companion that as a companion comes along <laughs> the journey with you okay let's go to <laughs> lee's soup round pick what's your number three pick lee okay so my five words i'm gonna hashtag is omg they killed renee bastards <laughs> hashtag time is the fire in which we burn fire it's, <laughs> It's Star Trek Generations, the house fire. Oh my so when God. you kind of think of like Star Trek, how many of our main characters kind of get killed off or people that we kind of know? And like, here we are, we're on the Star Trek, the next generation. It's gone onto the big screen. It's the passing of the baton. And like, they've, they've got this huge thread that runs through the, the film and basically incapacitates our kind of lead captain into absolute grief. And this is house fire that kills this wonderful young family. Renee is this charming young kid that dreams of looking to the stars, following in his uncle's footsteps. Robert, you know, this, you know, crabby old man, but, you know, he's keeping the kind of family going. And Marie, that is just this lovely woman, you know, doting on this family. And like they decide that, right, you can imagine this like board. You have Rick Berman talking about, let's get the two ships firing off each other. And then you've got like Braga and Berman, go, uh, Braga and um, Moore going, why do we kill the Picards? And it's like, I just find that so fascinating that you have this shocking event that wipes out 
three characters, you know, people that, you know, people think very fondly of family. And often I find that they don't seem to follow up with going, and remember they all got killed off in the first Next Generation movie. I find that really fascinating to see the consequences of that horrific event, you know, what it does to our captain. You know, you see a captain, you know, we talk about Kirk, you know, he's got the bravado, the arrogance, you know, he's this flawed individual. We basically see our first experience of Captain Picard on the big screen of like upset, angry, shouting at his crew, and then he's sobbing on the big screen to to Troy about how he wanted to keep the family line going and so on. And the consequences of that fire are, are shocking. And I just think that that you do that in a film. You we see you know Spock dies by a heroic sacrifice. Same with Data. You know we have um, David that gets tragically killed. But this is a, a you know a, a shocking event and. A, a, bit of a villain in a way about how it impacts you know characters that we care and love about in the first big film and I thought that was a really interesting kind of way to go and um, yeah it, you learn so much about Picard in, in this film and that's his really big kind of character arc that first contact and less so the other two yeah that's I love this this is totally an abstract pick and totally the villain because of Renee Renee is such a great character and the real villain here is that Renee and Robert were killed off screen like that after, and that they were recast after, after and that they were recast. <laughs> yes, the production production me. team is the real villain here. Uh, I, I, I love. Why Fire. did they recast them? I don't understand. They weren't going to be in the movie. You already had the rights to use their pictures, so like I don't know. It's so there's, weird. There's many reasons. They. I don't think those actors would have looked quite this. Oh, well, they should have just used old pictures. Whatever. Okay. Uh, I love this pick. What is your take on fire in generations? Uh, well, aside from it burning, you know, both time and, and the Picards, I think this is a great <laughs> pick, Ellie. I love this. Um, yeah, you know, I love Picard in Generations because we never, we rarely saw that side of him. And I love when, you know, and this, I love when Picard was kind of taken out of his comfort zone. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the character arc of Generations. I, I'm not a fan of, of like, Picard's weird Victorian Christmas dream, but we can that that's a, that's a, that that that's the real villain of that movie. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think this is a great pick, Lee. I think that that you know you talk about family as being a great episode, and it is a great episode. And again, you know, there's there seems to be this like running theme now of movies and or um, TV show, particular television episodes reinforcing each other and making each other better. And the reason that the the, the fire hits home no pun intended, so hard is because family is such a great episode, right? Renee is such a wonderful, innocent young child, right? And so it, it is a real villain because it basically kills a little part of the card. You think of like fire as well. It's such a, a painful, horrific way to go. Like yeah. you would kind of expect something like this to be like, oh, they were killed in sort of like a shuttle accident or something yeah, like that. Right, something like right. that, where they went like, you get this impression, especially when you watch Picard of like, you think of this family home just burning down, you know, even in the 24th century, this old antiquated house just burned down. There wasn't like the fire suppression system that you would expect kind of something modern to have. It's such a, a relatable and painful way to go. You just have this image of this kid essentially flailing to, flaming to death it's, it's horrible <laughs> take it down a notch <laughs> yeah well the other uh the other villain is robert picard because he obviously didn't believe in technology so he didn't <laughs> have a uh, fire suppression system and his whole family was killed because okay let's go let's close out the this cheery soup round with my Number three pick, and by the way, that was uh, Lee's first pick in which uh, he did not pick Captain Kirk in <laughs> movie villains. So his first two picks. I'm surprised included, you didn't pick Captain Kirk for generations. Let's be honest. Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do my pick. Five words and a hashtag. I bring order to chaos, something this show needs right now. Hashtag, I am the collective, and it is the Borg Queen from Star Trek First Contact. And I love this. I love the Borg Queen. Brilliant adjustment to the Borg. I love the the introduction of having a voice for the collective, like Locutus, and 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 what that meant for Picard and the the performance from Alice Krieg is just super super powerful. But also, it's like it's also quiet and subtle, and she's just really dynamic, dynamic uh, actor. And all, all her scenes with Data are incredible. 
And yeah, I just love the operatic nature of it. Very Shakespearean. And when you talk about all the, the great like lines in Star Trek, she has so many great villain moments in lines with watch your future's end and uh, I'm the beginning, the end, the one who is many. I am the Borg and my five words in a hashtag. I bring order to chaos. I am the collective. I, I just love this character. It's really grand and epic and it serves a, a, a really cool purpose. And uh, Alice Kriege is amazing. Oh, and, I'll, and I will say that there's, there's one other, there's one other line where she had, where she said to data that you imply disparity when none exists. And I think that really explains kind of how the, how the queen works. Cause uh, she's just the board. She is the collective as she says. I'm curious, do you control the Borg Collective? You imply a disparity where none exists. I am the Collective. Perhaps I should rephrase the question. I wish to understand the organizational relationships. Are you their leader? I bring order to chaos. An interesting, if cryptic, response. You are in chaos, Data. You are the contradiction, a machine who wishes to be human. Since you seem to know so much about me, you must be aware that I am programmed to evolve, to better myself. We too are on a quest to better ourselves, evolving toward a state of perfection. Forgive me, but the Borg do not evolve. They conquer. By assimilating other beings into our collective, we are bringing them closer to perfection. Somehow, I question your motives. Uh, Lee, what's your take on the Borg Queen? Yeah, the Borg Queen was uh, was a great pick as well because she's just one of these rich Star Trek kind of villains in terms of, you know, she has her end goal and so on. You know, we, we see so much about destruction, destroying humanity, and how she kind of tries to achieve her goals is sort of by manipulating one person. It really kind of boils it down to sort of the the battle to, to save Earth basically relies on her trying to convince Dea to turn against the Federation. It's not about her, the, having the biggest weapons or the biggest right. spaceship to cause disaster. And I, I, that makes for a really engaging thing where you think of something like maybe Nemesis. Okay, right, we've got to stop this guy before he gets some tholion radiation. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough or interesting. Yeah. But like that, it's like, it's the battle for a creature without a soul really to to see if he can turn and i love that and i never tire of watching her performance yeah that's a great summary uh carlos how about you um i i you know obviously this is a great pick i um i was once on the train going to destination star trek and i was sitting directly across from alice creech on the train for like 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 20 30 minutes and the entire time i mean that she was like reading a book and she had her headphones on so i wasn't going to disturb her but the entire time i was just like like the like right the board queen is like right here right in front of me um but she um she plays that character so again i think she just has so much fun with it and there's like a certain you know sexuality that she brings to the character that also works so well and you know you can't talk about the board queen without talking about her her the first time we see her and i think that is still one yep. of the best you know effect shots in all of star trek right and i think she i was always there i'll never understand kind of the the fan like backlash or reaction to like giving a voice to the board yeah uh, i was always like that's like look they were always meant to be like bees or ants like that was the inspiration of course there was going to be a queen that makes all the sense in the world yep. um and the fact that she comes later on voyager and really kind of you know gets things really you know spices things up on voyager and i love uh you know obviously in end game as well so i think i think she's she's a great villain and a kind of you know wonderful addition to this list yep and I love that creative introduction shot. It's just so well designed. Obviously stands the test of time. Okay, uh, we are somehow through three rounds on top five movie villains with no duplicates. I It is impossible for us to go all the way through this without duplicates, but who knows? We'll see. Carlos, what's your round two pick? I think you are right, Jim. I think it is impossible. So my five words are, now they are all bored. Uh, my hashtag dynamite with the laser beam, and it is also Star Trek First Contact, the Borg Queen. Fire! 
So, I mean, obviously we've said a lot of what I wanted to say already, yep. but I did want to add something is that Star Trek doesn't do a lot of female villains. It just doesn't. It's just, it's just the only real female villain in, in, in all the movies. Yeah. You can talk about Valeris and like things like that, but like really the main villain, the only female villain in any of the Star Trek movies is the Borg Queen. Well, it was Lur- Lursa and Bator, but they were... Oh, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Lursa and Bator. Okay, all right, whatever. I, your, your point... They're like supporting villains. Your point is taken. I mean, the vast majority of Trek villains are male, right? And I wanted to really kind of highlight that because, you know, yeah, you got Lursa and Bator, but they're, again, they're really supplementary villains. They're not, they're, they're not the big bad. You know, she deserves her own shout out for being the only main bad that is that is female. Um, so I think it's worth noting that. I think a lot of Star Trek's best villains, her and and the female shapeshifter, right? And so I think that I want Star Trek to do more female villains in the future. It's worth noting that, that the franchise has historically never done uh, very good female villains. But when they do, they knock it out of the park. And the poor queen is obviously uh, the queen of it all. Well, I have to mention Kai Wynn, too. Well, of course, Kai Wynn as well. Come well, you on. didn't. You, you said the female changing like four times, so I just wanted to say Kai. Okay, okay, all right, you're right. All you're right, right, let's go on round two. <laughs> Lee, what's your number two pick? So my one, my five words and a hashtag are reboot, prequel, enhanced by sequel. Hashtag the Romulans are dying, let them die. So I've gone with something just slightly kind of close to what you've gone for, but I've gone for the United Federation of Planets. Oh, so, oh there you go. Yeah. From 2009. This is, uh, this is almost a duplicate, but yeah. it's not, but it's the same motivation. So uh, yeah. I love it, Lee. Because Fantastic. when you think of it, like much as you kind of said earlier on, when you watch this film, you don't really get the idea of what the kind of Federation did. You have this guy just basically saying, I watched the Federation kind of fail. And you kind of go, oh, well. Yeah, well, they, they really tried. Think, yeah. Yeah. I don't see much evidence. I see the Vulcans kind of more involved. I don't see any starships involved. You know, if you include the countdown sequel, you know, that, that's something. But like you, you watch Star Trek 2009 and the real kind of villain and basically what kickstarts this whole thing is sort of that, that kind of Federation that, you know, they were slow to, to respond this essentially end up leaving the Romulan Empire to to die. And the Federation of Planets and Starfleet choose not to to help them. You know, we see the consequences of that in sort of the Picard timeline and also kind of what goes on in sort of the the Kelvin timeline as well. And it makes it all the kind of richer where it's like, you know, your Federation did nothing and allowed my people to burn while my planet broke in half. It has happened. I watched it happen. I saw it happen. Don't tell me it didn't happen. And now none of us can ever dispute that. We can watch Nero go... Oh, it happened. I watched it happen. I saw it happen. Don't tell me it ha- didn't happen. I'm going, yeah. did it? I didn't really see it happen. I saw sort of the Vulcans being a bit slow to kind of come to the rescue. It seemed like it was very fast what happened. You know, you're just a kind of madman trying to lash out here where you're like, yeah, fair point. You really got screwed over here by by the Federation. And, you know, they basically basically helped to oversee sort of a somewhat genocide of the, the Romulan species. And, you know, there's a lot of blame to to go around that's now enhanced by it it's it's so i think the the true villain and sort of i suppose if you maybe they're the good guys if you're a huge fan of the kelvin timeline movie is sort of the inaction of the the united federation of planets from the the council all the way down yeah well i love it remembrance star trek picard has added this layer of depth into into this film and that's a good thing there's nothing wrong with that i mean it's not like it was bad before it was certainly you could look at it and say, ah, well, maybe they, you know, they, they, it was uh, thin. Uh, but I love, again, this is what I love about my favorite thing about Trek is when pieces of the puzzle come together like this, even 10 years later, and connect those dots and tell that story. It's really, really cool. That's a great pick. Lee, uh, Carlos, what's your take? I mean, look, we've, we've chosen Captain Kirk. We've chosen the Enterprise, <laughs> the the crew of the Enterprise A, the Federation. I chose humanity. Yeah. Like, like yeah. this is going down not in the way I thought it was going to, boys. <laughs> no, Let me no. just say that. Uh, I thought we were all going to have, like, Borg Queen, Borg Queen, Borg Queen. Uh, <laughs> like, like, this is good. This is really good. All right. Well, everything that's been said. Let's uh, so let's close out round two. It took us this long to get here, but finally, at the end of round two, except my pick has a little bit of a spin. Five words and a hashtag. We offered the world order. Hashtag an attempt to unify humanity. It is Khan Nunyan Singh, except 
I'm picking Space Seed instead of the Wrath of Khan. Then your sympathies were with... You are an excellent tactician, Captain. You let your second in command attack while you sit and watch for weakness. You have a tendency to express ideas in military terms. This is a social occasion. <laughs> it has been said that uh, social occasions are only warfare concealed. Many prefer it more honest, more... You fled. Why? Were you afraid? I've never been afraid. But you left at the very time mankind needed courage. We offered the world order. Just a little bit of a twist up because he's still the movie villain. I'm picking Khan Noonie and Singh as the movie villain. But I love the fact that he's the only movie villain that is a continuation of something we saw in the Trek series. Khan is amazing. Ricardo Montalban is amazing. One of the most incredible performance, uh, just iconic in terms, not only Star Trek, but like just revered for what he did in the wrath of Khan. But I decided to pick space seed as my episode because I always questioned the fact that Kirk and Khan never got to be in the same room and actually have a, have it out. It was all on the view screen and I love that Khan is just so much smarter in Space Seed, where obviously he's driven by his his obsession and his revenge, and it's literally the wrath of Khan when they're when he's making all these moves to just keep digging himself in deeper and deeper in the wrath of Khan, and and Joaquin is trying to tell him we could just leave, we have a ship, we have Genesis, let's get out of here, and he's like, nope, I gotta kill Kirk, and it burns him. But in Spacey, it's just this amazing chess game. It's a script from, from Gene Kuhn. And the fact that Nicholas Meyer went and found this story and this, uh, this episode to basically save Star Trek, quote unquote, after the motion picture when they got a second movie, it was like, this better be, this movie better be good or otherwise not going to be any more Star Trek. And he found Khan. He found this thread in Space Seed and he made this amazing movie. And I just love the, the acting from Ricardo Montalban when he's squaring off in all these great scenes with Kirk and McCoy and Marla MacGyver's in Space Seed are incredible. So I'm taking Khan, but I'm choosing Space Seed. Uh, Lee, what's your take on that one? Yeah, I, I mean, I love the end of Space Seed. I mean, you could almost argue sort of the, the Federation again is sort of complicit in the rise of Kanda. Okay, they've banished him to this planet where it's, it's kind of lush that they will create their own kind of life. I mean, it's got one of the best, I suppose you could argue it's a hell of a cliffhanger because that's what kind of Nicholas Meyer sort of drew from it, where it's like it would be interesting, Captain, to return to that world in 100 years yeah. and to learn what crop has sprung uh, from that seed you planted today. And the fact that they kind of never go back, like you have this planet explode, it causes like the wipeout of this planet, you know, no one thought to go, let's go check in on them. You know, we, we stranded these people on there. We care for all life's important. Let's go check on them. No, we'll just leave them there. And, you know, I'm sure they're just stewing along nicely. No, no bad will ever kind of come of it. You know, when you think of how the Federation kind of treated those prisoners, it is absolutely shocking. It's not exactly a New Zealand penal colony on SETI Alpha 5. I mean, well, uh, Chekhov and Terrell went, went back, finally. to look Finally, finally. <laughs> uh, Carlos, what's your take on Khan? You threw Lursa and Bator at me, so I'm going to throw them right back at you, right? <laughs> they originated in the, uh, in, in the TV oh, show. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, they're, but, they're just right. a, but they're just a secondary villain. Oh, I see. Yes, I, I would agree with that argument. They're just a secondary villain. <laughs> Um, no, no, I, I mean, obviously, you know, I think that Khan is, um, you know, Khan is Khan, right? He's the main, he's, he's probably arguably the only Star Trek villain from a Star Trek film that has really kind of crossed over into popular culture. Uh, I think that, you know, maybe the Borg Queen in some respects, but, but more sci-fi. I think, you know, everybody knows the Wrath of Khan for some reason or another, whether it's you know, Shatner's kind of screaming Khan or the Kobayashi Maru or just his pecs for whatever reason, you know? And so I think that Nicholas Meyer obviously did, uh, he, he pulled a rabbit out of his hat and he wrote that script basically in a few days in his kitchen. Yep. And then he didn't even, he, he was so young when he wrote it 
He didn't even know that he had to, like, that he could get screen credit for it. He never got paid for it. It's just like an amazing story of how he single handedly changed Star Trek. And, you know, when you hear about how much Gene Roddenberry didn't like it and like all of these things, um, I, I think the making of Wrath of Khan. And if you haven't read, um, if you haven't listened to Nicholas Meyer talk about it in the commentaries, I suggest everyone do so. But also read A View from the Bridge, which is oh, yeah. kind of. It's just like autobiographical. It's weirdly, it, it is autobiographical, but it's really about his time on Star Trek. And it's just awesome, awesome. And so I think that, you know, Khan is truly the Star Trek villain for the ages and, and arguably the only Star Trek villain um, that has kind of crossed over into general popular culture. And so that says a lot about the the script, the, the you know, Ricardo Montalban's portrayal, but also Nicholas Meyer. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point about crossing over. All right, well, it took us uh, all the way to the second round to get a con pick. Let's let's uh, go to the first round and see see how we close this thing out. Carlos, what is your number one Trek movie villain? Ah, uh, well, uh, my five words are, ah, uh, Kirk, my old friend. Uh, and hashtag, <laughs> I've done my sentence but committed no crime. And it is con. Yes. So... Fire! Uh, Jim, you and I were kind of on the same wavelength these last two, yep. but I think, you know, we've said everything that, that needs to be said about Khan, except that we'll add one thing. You, you mentioned, Jim, about them never meeting. And as a kid, that kind of bothered me. It, it bothered William Shatner. He really wanted to have like a fist fight with Khan and really right. kind of overpower him. And Nicholas Meyer, like really stuck to his guns and was like, no. As I got older, the more I appreciated that these were like, you know, these were two guys in submarines fighting each other. And, and you know, and, and he has them take place in a nebula. You know what I mean? That kind of looks like yep. the ocean. And it's just, it just, it works on so many levels. But the thing that I think works the most about Khan is that Khan dies thinking he won. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. I, right? I, that always bugs me too. I think. But, but, but. <laughs> That yeah, was a it fascinating a choice. Fascinating choice. Completely. And, and and as a kid, I was always like, why is the last shot, Khan's last shot before he blows up, not the Enterprise warping away? It right. would have been the ultimate F you. I know. You know? I know. But actually, when Nicholas Meyer he and he talks about it deliberately, that was a deliberate choice, right? <laughs> to have Khan die thinking he won. And I just think that that really just elevates him so much because from his perspective, he beat Captain Kirk. He got his, you know, he got his vengeance. He got his revenge. He got, you know, his wrath, his wrath won out. And I just think it's amazing. All right. I'm sold. <laughs> Good added perspective that that was a choice by Nicholas Meyer. Okay, Lee, what is your number one Trek movie villain? Yeah, so my five words and uh, hashtag are Peter Weller's at it again. Hashtag can is just a distraction. So I've gone with Admiral Marcus from Star Trek Into Darkness, the true villain of that movie. You know, you were going in order and I was wondering who this <laughs> could be. Uh, it's another bad role. We have a second bad role. <laughs> yeah, I've gone with this one because like Peter Weller is just one of the most charismatic kind of villains around. And I think there's interviews with him where he's oh, like, so well, well, people say like Marcus is a bad guy. I mean, He's not wrong about anything. I hate when people say he's a bad guy. So I apologize to uh, no doubt Trek fan, uh, Trek ranks listener Peter Weller that's listening just just now. No doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Here. So, um, I mean, he basically kickstarts all of the antics in this movie. That he wakes up, can you have him where he wants to destroy the Enterprise? He's willing to kill his own daughter. He sends Kirk off to go blast up kind of Klingons. You know, he has one of the coldest lines in sort of all of Star Trek where it's like, Kirk is like, you know what? I'm going to make the ultimate sacrifice here. Can I, I give myself to you. Take me, spare my crew. And then he's like, I was never going to spare your crew. And it's just like, it's just like he has no reason to actually kill this crew, but he's like, I'm going to do them anyway from his like big bad guy spaceship. I just think he's such an interesting kind of villain. And I think Art Into Darkness has, it certainly has its flaws. And I think very much the third act is where it sort of starts to fall apart for, for me and so on. But I think Admiral Marcus is a hell of a kind of villain that, that kind of threads through a lot of the movie in terms of the consequences of his actions. And I think 
the problem I have somewhat with this movie is you think of something like we've talked about, Undiscovered Country. It's very much drawn from the times, Chernobyl, the fall of the Berlin mm -hmm. Wall. It's very precedent. Whereas sort of Into Darkness, what it's saying about, you know, someone might come at you, give you the biggest smack to your country, your people, you know, your fleet. But basically, you shouldn't rush to, to vengeance and sort of go down these kind of roads. I mean, the, the lines can also be drawn between sort of the, the war on terror, the kind of parallels people have drawn with kind of Admiral Marcus and kind of modern day politicians. It all kind of came out sort of that 10 years, just a little too late to really pack a punch about sort of warfare and sort of how we should all respond. But I think Marcus is a fantastic villain and someone that is so cold, but I just love the way he delivers these these lines, sort of how he manipulates Kirk to go off and do his bidding in terms of what he's going to do with the Klingons and sort of how he tries to manipulate Khan but fails. I think Marcus is the, the true villain of the film, but obviously Khan becomes sort of that villain in sort of the, the third act. But really it's Marcus that's the, the main one. It's a great pick. I love it. And Peter Weller is amazing, obviously, through throughout his career and in this and in this role. I mean, just a really bad, bad dude. I mean he's gonna kill his daughter. What the hell? If you think about it, there's only like two episodes that separate him from his last villainous turn. You I have know. Like, these I are the know. voyages, then Star Trek 2009. It's, it's like, wait, he's back again. So if you're doing like one of these Star Trek rewatches, you're like going to go, they not found someone sort of between these, <laughs> one episode in a movie. I'm glad you said that because that was definitely kind of an odd, interesting thing. It was 10, you know, good uh, 10 years apart, but literally like three episodes apart. Um Carlos, what's your take on Admiral Marcus? I got to be honest with you. I have seen Star Trek Into Darkness twice in my life. I saw it opening night, and then I saw it two days later, and I have not seen it since. That's my least favorite Star Trek movie. I love Peter Weller, but obviously because as a kid I loved RoboCop, and um, you know, and I like the fact that he's got he's got some he's got some great sci-fi cred for for not just because of RoboCop, but even Enterprise. Right? There's so many things about that movie, you know that don't make any sense to me. And one is this like massive, massive thing that he's like starship that he's building in like in our solar system that like nobody seems to know about, but like, you know, everyone's involved. It's just very bizarre to me. So like, I never really connected with that movie and I'm trying to be Jim knows. I'm like trying to be the most diplomatic. I'm rolling possible. my eyes so hard right now. All right. What did you think of, what, what do you think of Admiral Marcus though? Um, I, I, I have no opinion. <laughs> you have no memory because you need to watch I, I, Into Darkness again. Okay. You're sitting there let's, scrambling that memory alpha right now let's going, go. who is Admiral Marcus Let's again? go. You need to rewatch it, man. Okay. I do not. I do not need to rewatch it. <laughs> All right. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to close it out. This is this Trek Ranks. You are listening to Trek Ranks, everybody. <laughs> All right. My number one pick. It's another duplicate. Fire! Five words and a hashtag. Carlos, as much as we've disagreed on this, we uh, this is our third duplicate, man. Uh, go. Five words and a hashtag. Hunting species to extinction? Illogical hashtag. The ultimate villain. And we've already talked about this. It's man from Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And I'll just put a bow on it. We've already talked about it. They're, literally, they say it in the film. Jillian Taylor says, unfortunately, their principal enemy, talking about the whales, is far, far more aggressive. And Kirk says, you mean man. Mean man. <laughs> to put it mildly, she says. And I'm a big, I love whales. I love dolphins. I've been to uh, kayaking to Hawaii many times. And when you see a humpback whale emerge like 50 feet in front of you, it's, I'm telling you, you can't even imagine somebody trying to kill one of these creatures. Or, or if you're underwater and you can actually hear the whale songs. Ah, uh, amazing. So yeah, the, the whalers at the end, I thought about picking them. I thought about picking Bob. That guy's a, an ass. <laughs> an but, ass. Uh, but it's man, just like uh, Carlos had in round four. So we'll close it out there unless anybody's got another comment on Star Trek IV. I, I, I would like to know if Lee likes the Federation. Lee, do you like Star Trek? <laughs> I do, yes. I like Star Trek. But when you watch so much of it every day for years and years, you kind of have to constantly look at new and exciting angles to, uh, it's to amazing. enhance the films and so on. I mean, this is the type of thing people would have been discussing on the, the Trek VBS boards back in the day of like, yeah. isn't the real villain 
fire. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Let's see what you can do with the secondary systems. Okay, let, any secondary systems picks? Anyone you want to rattle off there, Carlos? You know, I thought a lot about um, like trying to figure out a way for like, for V'ger to be a villain, and I just couldn't get there. And I was like, well, yeah, it didn't you know, really work. It didn't really work, and I wanted I wanted to kind of talk about motion picture because, again, like Star Trek Four, it's a movie that doesn't have a big bad. And I love that about v- I love that about the motion picture. V- Viger was the villain because it was such an obvious uh, knockoff of Nomad from the Changeling. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Lee, how about you? Do you have any? Yeah, I had a few. I was I had Captain Kirk from the motion picture. We kind of touched on that one earlier. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> He's like Captain Kirk for Star Trek two, three, four, five, and six. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, Kirk is covered in three of your yeah. picks because you had the well, no feather. I guess UFP. I guess he was dead. So yeah, yeah. We, David's killer in the search for Spock. Yeah, I'm not that yes. in the search for Spock. Just give them the ship and let them go. You don't I have know. to call a thing. Day and generations for being so cowardly and letting Jordy uh, be captured. Admiral Hayes from First Contact, they basically have half the fleet destroyed because they're too <laughs> stupid to kind of let the Enterprise E go save the day. And the designers of the Yorktown base in Star Trek Beyond, come on, guys. You are clearly asking for trouble with that design. Oh, man. S- S- snow globe in space. Giant snow globe in space. All right, I'll just throw We did have two bad rules picked. There was also... Admiral Dougherty from Star Trek Insurrection. Yeah. I think, I actually think Ruafo is a, a pretty fun uh, villain, F. Murray Abrahams. And I like the reveal at the end that they were the same uh, race as the Baku. And I think that's about it. There was no mention of uh, Krug. Yeah. And I cannot believe General Chang. I mean, that was one of your, your favorites didn't get picked either. So uh, no Krug and no Chang. A crazy episode of Trek Ranks. Everybody, thanks for sticking with us. Let's run through our regeneration cycle and recap our picks. Computer, activate regeneration cycle. Alcoves beta and gamma. Okay, Carlos, uh, run down your top five. So uh, for my number five pick, I had Fleet Admiral Cartwright from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. For my number four pick, I had Humanity Itself from Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. My number three was Dr. Tolian Soren from Star Trek Generations. Two was the Borg Queen from Star Trek First Contact. And last, but certainly not least, was Ricardo Moltamban's Khan from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Okay, fantastic list. You had three from the TOS era and two from the TNG era. Uh, Lee, how about you break down your five? I got good stats on you. Yeah, so I've gone for Admiral Kirk from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the Enterprise A senior staff in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, Fire from Star Trek Generations, the United Federation of Planets from Star Trek 2009, and Admiral Marcus from Star Trek Into Darkness. All all we need to know is you had four, uh, basically the Federation was four of your five picks. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing, amazing. A uh, look from Lee. All right, my top five. Number five was Nero from Star Trek 2009. Number four was Balthazar Edison from Star Trek Beyond. Number three, the Borg Queen from Star Trek First Contact. Number two was Khan Noonien Singh from Space Seed. And number one was man from star trek for the voyage home all right here are some statistics we had three duplicates we had two bad rolls here is we had one fire so one classical element was was represented fire <laughs> there was two borgs one elorian and one romulan and then we had five individual humans but th- but humans made up nine of the uh of the 15 picks because two of us picked man and then you had the entire crew and then the entire federation lee uh the breakdown of episodes was actually pretty amazing there was so tm the motion picture search for spark final frontier insurrection and nemesis did not get a mention we had one each from into darkness and beyond and then two each from the wrath of khan the voyage home The Undiscovered Country, Generations, First Contact, and 2009. So nobody got three votes, but that's only really because I 
chose Khan from from Space Seed instead of the Wrath of Khan. Of course, you didn't even choose Khan. You chose James C. Kirk from the Wrath of Khan. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I love it. All right. Fantastic comprehensive fix for this finite topic. But as always, we've once again entered a temporal causality loop. So before we can depart, it's time to hear from you. The Enterprise has been caught up in a temporal causality loop. And I suspect that something similar may have happened to you. All right. And for this week's temporal causality loop, we're going to go back a bit, a bit of a ways to episode 78 in our episode of the top five episodes where the ship is a character. And for this one, we got in another great voicemail. We've had a lot of voicemails coming in and we've been slowly catching up. This one is from Chris Powers. He didn't leave his Twitter or social handles, but hopefully you're listening, Chris, because, uh, this list is awesome, and we're really glad you sent it in. So we're going to go ahead and play that for you right now. Although, unfortunately, it cuts off a little bit at the end, but just after he gets in his awesome uh, number one pick, which is a really great uh, pick. So listen to this. Hello, Trek Ranks. This is Chris Powers from Northumberland, Pennsylvania, and I have five picks for the top five episodes where the ship is a character, episode number 78. My number five pick for five words is uh, Zora Finds Her Funny Face, hashtag Homer's Odyssey in Space. This is the Short Treks episode, season one, number two, uh, Calypso. And the character is Zora, the evolved consciousness of the USS Discovery. I think this episode picks up on Homer's Odyssey, where there's a character who's been away for 10 years fighting war, and he is shipwrecked, and... Someone cares for him. Calypso cares for Odysseus. Um, she's a goddess and falls in love with him, but he can't stay. Similarly to um, Zora caring for Kraft when he can't stay with her either. Um, so that's a really cool uh, episode. My number four pick, five words, love letter to TOS fans. Hashtag TOS in nine minutes. The episode is Short Treks. Season 2, Episode 4, Ephraim and Dot, and the character is Dot. That robot is essentially the Enterprise, part of the Enterprise, and uh, that's a great episode for the ship as a character. Pick number three, five words, is the Phoenix in the Flesh, hashtag historical irony, and the pick is the TNG movie First Contact. And of course, the Phoenix, Zephan Cochran's warp ship, is the character I love it when Deanna says to Picard and Data, would you three like to be alone? For pick number two, five words are, she's got the right name, hashtag she'll always bring you home. And this is the episode uh, Encounter at Farpoint, the TNG pilot. Of course, the character is the Enterprise D, and it's a really neat scene with uh, McCoy and Data, and McCoy is... Uh, introducing the new character of the Enterprise D scene. And she, he says, if you treat her like a lady, she'll always bring you home. And then, of course, in the episode when Picard is getting ready to um, run away from the Q entity, he says, let's see what this galaxy-class starship can do. And we are introduced to this new character. And for my number one pick for uh, ships as characters, five words, Old friends and good memories, hashtag the adventure continues. And this is Picard season one, episode two, Maps and Legends. And the character is the Enterprise D once again. This is the scene where Picard enters into Starfleet headquarters and looks up at the Enterprise D. All right. Awesome list from Chris. We really appreciate him sending it, sending that in. I love his last pick, which got cut off there a little bit, but he chose... Uh, the Enterprise in the lobby above Captain Picard in Star Trek Picard Maps and Legend, which is a super cool moment yeah. where the ship is really uh, a character. So awesome job. Okay, more than enough to get us out of this week's temporal causality loop. So as always, I want to thank everyone for all your great responses to the Trek Ranks podcast. Please keep your list coming to me at Trek Ranks on Twitter so we can retweet them. But we also want to hear from you, so put together your own list of top five movie villains or any list from any of our past shows. Give us a call at the Tricorder Transmissions at 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-5527.
at 609-512-LLAP. Or you can just record it yourself and then send me a DM and we can uh, download it that way. So hopefully we'll hear from you so you can be featured on the next episode of Trek Ranks. And on the next episode of Trek Ranks, we have got a fun one for you. And it's coming up fast in honor of the debut of Star Trek Lower Decks. We are previewing the series right as it launches here on CBS All Access with a cool topic, as you might know. The framing of Lower Decks is that the hero ship is one of hundreds of less important ships out there in the Federation, and their main job is second contact. And that little nugget tells me everything I want to know about this show. I'm totally buying in. I love it. So in honor of that framing of the USS Cerritos and what they're going to be doing, we are doing our top five first contact moments and that show is going to be awesome. So it's, uh, it's Trek Ranks. It's Lower Decks. Can't wait. So Carlos and Lee, right now, if you had to choose one of your favorite first contact moments, what would it be? There's some big ones. There's some little ones. Carlos, how about you, man? What would be your first contact moment off the top of your head? Oh, my God. The moment you said it, and this is a big one, but my mind just went straight to Broken Bow from, um, from, from Enterprise. And I remember vividly sitting in college, like it was my, friend, my, my, my sophomore year of college, watching the opening sequence of Enterprise. And, and Farmer like Moore. To the Kling- yeah, exactly. And Farmer Moore with his shotgun and he shoots a Klingon. It's just, to me, it was, it was awesome back then. And, you know, I, I, I have a soft spot for Enterprise and I just think that that pilot is phenomenal. And, and then them using that first scene of the new series, which was a prequel, to introduce us to Star Trek's, like, you know, arguably, um, you know, one of the three big alien races was just was just amazing. So immediately I went there. Fantastic. I love that. It's a deep cut. How about you, Lee? Uh, it was an episode I just rewatched the the other day um, after a friend said, why are the disco cast not doing sort of like a live table read of Move Along Home? And that's got to be the Wadi from uh, the Move Wadi. Along Home. <laughs> So I, I think that episode gets an unfair amount of stick. It is a really interesting concept. They go all in in it. You know, you've got Cisco talking about how great first contact is. Yep. You know, it's like one of the best things a Starfleet officer can ever do. And it all ends in disaster. So, you know, there's some really good humorous tones in there in terms of Cisco's disappointment, what happens. You know, so it could make a nice little double feature with, with Lower Decks. It's actually a perfect setup for Lower Decks. I am so looking forward to Lower Decks. I, I just love that that premise. And those are two awesome deep cut picks. All right, so before we wrap it up here, a huge thanks to Carlos Miranda and Lee Hutchison. Great to have you guys back on the show. Any final Trek subspace communications you guys want to relay before we depart? Carlos, hope you had fun ar- arguing with me. I always, man. This is the best. I enjoy this so much. I, I really had a lot of fun tonight. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I always love chatting with you boys, and I just think that tonight was particularly fun. And I love learning that Lee would just kind of really wants to watch like Star Trek Romulan as opposed to like any other <laughs> that we've been doing for 50 years. Uh, that's awesome. Lee, how about you, man? Yeah, it's been been really good fun. It's been a really fun lockdown challenge to to take a subject like this where you think, yeah, it's so small and, and really kind of expanding it out. So I really enjoyed kind of sharing thoughts with you guys. It's been a, been a real pleasure. And I'm going to go back and sort of like back to a darkened room now because that's clearly where I mind like mine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's a great different way to look at it and definitely added to a topic like this, which could have been just, you know, seven or eight duplicates. Okay, and thank you for engaging with us again here on episode 89 of the Trek Ranks podcast. As always, I want to close by saying I'm looking forward to standing with you again here in this place where I belong. Captain, we're being hailed. Hello. I'm Captain Christopher Pike. To whom am I speaking? Hi, Christopher. I'm Nero. You've declared war against the Federation. Withdraw. I'll agree to arrange a conference with Romulan leadership at a neutral location. I do not speak for the Empire. We stand apart. (laughs) 
just want to remind everyone again that the entire Trek Ranks catalog is available for you to download and listen to at trekranks.com and on your podcast player of choice. Our episodes never get carbon data, so check out the topics you've missed and maybe just want to listen to again over at trekranks.com. And a reminder to check out our friends Five Year Mission at fiveyearmission.net. They're writing a song for every episode of Star Trek, and you won't believe how great their music is. They also have a podcast at the Trek Geeks Network, so seek them out. You won't regret it. Do whales attack people, like in Moby Dick? No. No, most whales don't even have teeth. They have a soft, gum-like tissue that strains vast amounts of tiny shrimp for food, and that is the limit of their hostility. Unfortunately, their principal enemy is far, far more aggressive. You mean man? To put it mildly. Since the dawn of time, men have harvested whales for a variety of purposes, most of which can be achieved synthetically at this point. One hundred years ago, using hand-thrown harpoons, man did plenty of damage. But that is nothing compared to what he has achieved in this century. This is mankind's legacy. Whales hunted to the brink of extinction. Virtually gone is the blue whale, the largest creature ever to inhabit the earth. Despite all attempts at banning whaling, there are still countries and pirates currently engaged in the slaughter of these inoffensive creatures. Where the humpback whale once numbered in the hundreds of thousands, today there are less than 10,000 specimens alive and those that are taken in are no longer fully grown. In addition, many of the female whales are killed, while still bearing unborn calves. To hunt a species to extinction is not logical. Whoever said the human race was logical? <laughs>